For our next speaker, we have Senyo Simpson from all the way from South Africa, here to talk about um, his work at Fly.io, um, working on networking stuff in Rust. Please give a hand for Senyo. Uh, cool. Um, what's up, everybody? Yeah, came all the way from South Africa. Uh, it's good to be here. Good to see everybody. Um, pretty much all new faces to me. So, yeah. Um, cool. My talk is on uh, the work I do at Fly.io, so building confidence, embracing Rust at Fly. Uh, who am I? Uh, I'm Senyo. I'm a software engineer at Fly, of course. And I work on the networking team. Uh, based in Cape Town, South Africa. You can find me uh, on Twitter at Senyesus. I write fairly irregularly at senyosimpson.com. I haven't posted in two years, which means I've got to write a new blog engine. Uh, <laughs> 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 and uh, my, you can find me on Mastodon at sm at hashidom. Cool, this is just a picture of Cape Town. I just like to show people where I'm from. Not many people have been to Africa, so it's just, it looks cool. Um, cool, so my talk is kind of like in, in two parts. The first part is uh, Rust and Fly and what that's all about, and then the second part, part is on uh, why we consider Rust uh, an important language for us, but also generally um, going forward. So Fly, who are we? Um, our value proposition is pretty simple. Deploy your app servers close to your users, uh, run your full stack apps and databases, all over the world, no ops required. This is basically off our um, web page. Um, and the premise there is that uh, if you can run your apps close to users, you minimize latency, of course. So you can kind of think about it as a CDN for full stack apps. So instead of only caching uh, static content, you can just run your whole app close to your users um, and defeat the slowness of the speed of light. Um, fun facts about us, so we're about 50 people and growing. We're a distributed company, so we've got people everywhere, Tokyo, myself in Cape Town, London, some people in Spain, Brazil, US, and Canada. So I might have left some places out. So yeah, pretty much everywhere. It's cool. It's a good excuse. I really want to go to Tokyo, so now I have an excuse to go. Um, your apps run in micro VMs powered by Firecracker. So Contrary to popular belief, they don't actually run in Docker containers. Um, we kind of transform them into Firecracker VMs. Uh, we run our own platform on our own hardware. Um, so no AWS, no GCP, no Azure. Though to be fair, Firecracker is made by AWS, so you can't run away from them fully. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and uh, we're in 40 regions and counting. That might be a lie. We were supposed to be in 40 regions by the time of this talk. We might be in, we were like, we're around 32, um, so the most important thing is that we're in a lot of regions, um, <laughs> so you can run your apps close to your users. Um, the magic behind Flower, so just a quick overview of kind of like how that platform or how it looks. So you package your app as a Docker container or the Docker file, um, or use build packs. We take that and convert it into a Firecracker VM. We have a blog post about it, I think it's called Docker Without Docker, about how that whole process basically works. Um, and then we have a scheduler, Nomad, and also FlyD. It's an internal uh, scheduler that we've written. Um, and that will place your uh, application on a host in whatever regions you specify. So in this case, Canada, the UK, of course, we're here, and uh, South Africa, because I'm from there. That's the justification for these flags, but you know. Um, cool, so that's basically kind of like an overview of how everything works. Um, and if you're anything like me, the first thing I wondered when I got to Fly is how in the world does routing work? Like, sure, you can run your apps in five regions, but how does it get to the closest one if I'm in South Africa versus uh, if you're in the US? Um, and the magic behind that's called any cost routing. So the basis of that is multiple servers announce the same IP address. So instead of having like a unicast address where one IP address maps to a certain host, uh, multiple servers announce that same IP address. Uh, and then the magic of internet routing selects a route based on some prioritization scheme. Most common of these is latency, and that's how uh, it ends up being uh, the, the server closest to wherever you're originating the request from. Um, the magic of internet routing is obviously vague. The kind of idea behind that is that there's BGP metrics, so BGPs, 
uh, announces particular routes and there are certain metrics and latency is often uh, one of the higher priority metrics that gets used. Um, and so through that mechanism, uh, yeah, your requests get routed to the closest instance. Um, but that's basically only half the story. Uh, and so, yeah, we also have an internal proxy uh, called Fly Proxy, and that's written in Rust. It's built on top of Tokyo, Hyper, and Tower. Uh, proxies, TCP, HTTP, WebSockets, load balancing. Oh, this, oh, okay. Ah, there you go. Um, does load balancing and TLS termination, so like all the kind of standard things uh, a, a proxy would do, basically. Um, and why I say that uh, any cost reading is only half the story is because Fly Proxy drives our internal any cost network. So uh, every request coming into our platform goes through Fly Proxy, and then Fly Proxy is actually responsible for routing those requests from our edge network to the nearest instance. So uh, I actually have a diagram for that. So this is the Fly.io cinematic universe. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and you can see we have clients uh, in different countries, so uh, one in France, Mexico, and Rwanda. Uh, then we have edge nodes, which uh, form part of our edge network. These are the uh, servers that are like publicly available, I guess. Um, and in this case, we have one in the UK, Canada, and one in South Africa. And then we have these workers, which are in our internal uh, network. So re requests get routed to our edge, and that's over public internet, and then internally, uh, we route it from uh, the, the edge to your app. So apps only run <coughs> on worker nodes. Uh, and in this case, we've got one in the UK and one in the US. So other things about this, we run Fly Proxy on every single node on the edge and on workers, uh, which I'll explain a bit more. And then we have corrosion. Uh, corrosion is our internal state uh, replication system. So if Fly Proxy obviously has got to route uh, a request to uh, the instance nearest you. It has to have a global picture of where all instances are, how far they are away from you, um, and know how to route to that uh, certain to whichever instance is closest. Um, so yeah, corrosion is our state replication tool. It uses, I think, SUM protocol. I'm not too uh, clued up on it specifically. Um, it's also written in Rust and. I think replic oh, and yeah, it uses like a gossip. So swim is a gossip protocol, so gossips information. That means it's eventually consistent, uh, which isn't as huge of a problem as you might think, because uh, if, for instance, uh, instance gets deleted, and the, the request lands, and, and we still think that that, that instance still exists, we'll just retry it on another uh, node if you have multiple replicas. Uh, otherwise, it'll fail, and you can retry. Um, <coughs> but yeah, just walking through a scenario here, so I'm sitting in Rwanda, I make a request to whatever app that I have, um, that will get uh, routed to our edge node, um, <coughs> and that uh, happens over this BGP any cost routing, so that's over the public internet. Fly proxy will then pick up that request uh, and then proxy it to uh, whichever instance is closest to you. So from South Africa, the closest instance is um, the UK. That fly proxy uh, on that worker node will then proxy it to your application. Uh, one question we get asked fairly regularly is why do we run, oh, let me just get some water here quickly. <coughs> cool. So why do we run fly proxy on both edge and workers? We could, in theory, just proxy it straight from the edge to your app instance. Um, we have a couple of reasons for that, but one that's quite compelling is that your app can originate requests to other apps. So you can think about it like uh, you have an organization and you might want to have multiple different applications. So you can think of like microservices architecture and you want microservice A to talk to microservice B uh, and you still want all the benefits of the proxy. So you still want the load balancing, you still want the TLS termination um, and you still want to be able to route to the nearest instance. So uh, your apps can then just talk to other apps uh, or other microservices in this case. Um, uh, through the proxy, essentially. Um, so that's why we run it on uh, all instances. So talking about values of Fly Proxy, values are just what we consider extremely important to Fly Proxy, and it's kind of like a precursor to the second half of my talk. But uh, the things we think are really important for us is performance, of course. I mean, it's a proxy at the end of the day. 
uh, but I'll expand on that further. Predictability in predictability in performance, so we don't want like uh, crazy latency spikes at intermittent or unpredictable times. Um, and reliability is a core piece of our infrastructure. Every request goes through it. If it goes down, none of your apps work. You get angry. Our forums get flooded, and ooh, the world ends. So <laughs> um, it's important for for it to be reliable. Um, so yeah, why Rust? Why Rust or Fire Proxy? Uh, so I saw this article some time ago about uh, some behavioral economics or something that you should always talk about the bad things first and then the good things. Um, and it's actually inconclusive, but it makes sense to me to give you the bad news first. So start with the bad news, finish off with the good news. So the bad news with Rust is that Rust is simply awesome. <laughs> And you're probably asking me, like, you know, saying you're so biased, like, why would you say that? And the reason why is because you'll want to learn it. And if you want to learn Rust, you have to fight the borrow checker and find the borrow checker. <laughs> it's too much pain. I always say Rust is an exercise in finding the borrow checker. Um, but seriously. Uh, yeah. So bad news, of course, it's got an infamous learning curve. We all know Rust is not that simple uh, to learn. Uh, I saw this article about uh, why, or a I think it's called a cautionary tale um, for using Rust in startups, and uh, some of these reasons are from there. So libraries and documentation not as comprehensive or as mature, or for um, or not as comprehensive as more mature languages. Uh, iteration time can be slow because you're forced to model your whole domain. So if you want to make changes, you've got to propagate that through. Otherwise, the compiler will complain. Uh, Rust ramp up time is significant. So anywhere from one to six months. In contrast, like if you're experienced, Go it takes about two weeks to a month. Um, that was true for me. I pretty found, uh, found Go pretty easy to pick up, whereas Rust took me some time. Also, this one to six months, I saw it in like a AWS blog post, and since like half of Rust works at AWS, must be true. <laughs> um, that's a joke. And uh, the benefits of good Rust experience are difficult to find and hire. Of course, our ecosystem isn't as big as like a Golang or a Python, so. Um, it's not it's not always that difficult, but it's not as easy um, as some of the bigger ecosystems. The good news about Rust is that Rust is simply awesome, um, and some reasons why you can use it in almost any layer of the stack. That was really cool for me. I started learning Rust to building CLI tools, um, but then ended up reading Tokyo just because it was accessible to me. So it was cool to be able to just. Uh, you can kind of go up and down the stack as you wish, just by knowing the language. Um, the tool chain, of course, everyone loves Cargo. Performance, it's fast. Memory and thread safety, that's like reason the Rust core essence. Um, yeah, powerful and expressive task system, no garbage collector, so you can use it for systems programming. Uh, friendly compiler er error messages, and it's, it's all, good to, all too good to be true. It feels like, you know, you start coding and you fight the borrow checker and you do this bit of an intricate dance and it just pops out like something nearly perfect um, that you can run in production. So it uh, feels too good to be true. Um, I guess at the expense of fighting the borrow checker. So why Rust for Fly Proxy? A couple of reasons. So performance, of course. Uh, every request goes to Fly Proxy, as I was saying. So if Fly Proxy is slow, our whole platform is slow. Um, and we have about a 100 millisecond budget. Uh, there was like a, I think it's Google posted some, I think it was either a paper or a post about how uh, for an app to feel instantaneous, it has to, you have to um, get a response back in about 100 milliseconds. Some people say 200 milliseconds, but let's say 100. Uh, and so, you know, if Flower Proxy ate about 80 milliseconds of that, for instance, then we leave everything else with 20 milliseconds left to respond. So, uh, we've got about a 100 millisecond budget for the whole request to be serviced. It has to be fast. Predictable performance, um, so we cannot have unpredictable latency spikes. So if you're looking at a language like a, that has a garbage collector, if you push it too far uh, at intermittent periods in time, garbage will be collected and that will cause latency spikes. We have a 100 millisecond budget, we'll blow our whole budget if we have that. Um, especially at high load, because then we'll just end up queuing a whole lot of requests. So that's also an important thing. And then reliability, so it's a critical piece of our infrastructure um, and we rely, uh, must be able to rely on it to operate reasonably well. Um, and Rust gives us a lot of uh, confidence and safety 
that when we put it in production, it's performant, we've handled all our errors, we won't get null pointer dereferences or exceptions or anything like that. Um, and so these are kind of like motivating reasons uh, for using Rust with Fly Proxy. But uh, for our stations, these qualities are nothing new to your ears. You're here for these very reasons. You already know it's fast. You know it gives you safety. We're all hyped about it. That's why there's so many of us here today. Um, and you believe in Rust promises. And so, yeah, the second part of my talk really is just uh, on this idea of coding with confidence or building confidence. Um, and the idea that Rust and the, the values that it has and the kinds of things it promotes uh, has this higher order effect of uh, allowing you to code with confidence and deploy your apps into production with a lot of confidence. So there's this idea of values in software. I got this from uh, listening to a lot of talks by Brian Cantrell. I think he's like either CTO or CEO of Oxide Computer. Um, yeah, and he talks about software values. So software values are the things that are most important to uh, a particular piece of software. And given uh, you know, what the community thinks about or what they uh, treasure in that community. So uh, software choices are based on its values. And these values are born from situational context and further by the community. By situational context, I really mean uh, programming languages and any, in any other piece of technology is really born from the context in which it's surrounded by. So Rust obviously was born from the fact that C and C++ have a lot of memory and safety or memory issues. Um, and so that's the kind of like core essence of Rust. Um, but then those values are furthered by the community. So uh, uh, we still care about safety. Um, and so that's a big um, uh, value that we all care about and is furthered uh, in the development of Rust. Uh, so yeah, these values are important as they direct the evolution of that software. Uh, and a mismatch in values between what you value and what your software value will create like an ever-growing chasm. So if you really care about performance uh, and you use a programming language that really cares about like approachability at the expense of performance, you'll never uh, align on those values and that language probably won't evolve in the direction that you want it to evolve because they don't care about, not that they don't care, they just don't care about it as much as you do, in essence. Um, and that doesn't make it wrong, it just makes it different. And I think that's an important thing in our field that we like to argue about the merits of each technology. Um, but technology is made in certain contexts and we care about different things and that, again, just makes it different. Uh, not everybody wants to write the highest performing Rust code ever. So some people don't care about memory safety, you know. <laughs> just is what it is. Um, so yeah, just some like examples of values. So we've got velocity, debuggability. I don't know if that's a word. I saw it on Brian Cantrell's slide. If it's not, it's his fault. Um, <laughs> performance, expressiveness, approachability. So these are just things that uh, you might care about in a given piece of software. Um, so yeah, before going into Rust, I just want to talk about uh, like Linux's values that or that I perceive. Um, of course, performance, stability, compatibility, probably the biggest one. Um, but they also care about security, debuggability, extensibility. Um, but the way you can kind of think about it is these, the, let's say like the first three year performance, stability, and compatibility, those are the things that they care about the most. And they will, if they're given two difficult choices, they probably wouldn't choose uh, improving the extensibility of Linux uh, over stability, for instance, or compatibility. Um, so those are the things that they really care about and that the community over time uh, will push or develop or evolve that software in that direction, um, potentially at the expense of other things that are, are, are important, but not as important. Um, where something like a OpenBSD really cares about security, for instance. Um, so Rust, so these are some of the things that I think and I guess that we all think are really important in Rust, um, and some examples that, uh, to prove that we care about them. So performance, uh, we've got zero cost abstractions like futures. Uh, we remove green threads before Rust 1.0 uh, because of the performance over it. So you can really see that they really care about performance. Safety, we've got the borrow checker. Uh, correctness, ownership rules, and our like, option and result types. Um, they ensure that the code runs correctly and it's reliable. And then ergonomics, so the tri-macro, they introduced that to improve the ergonomics and uh, something like eliding lifetimes. 
uh, so you don't have to place them everywhere in your code. Um, but we also care about approachability, so we've got crazy amounts of Rust learning materials, videos, talks, podcasts, you name it, it's there. Um, expressiveness, so things like abstract data types and functional programming elements, uh, we've got them there. It really allows you to write code in a really nice way, uh, depending on your application. And portability, so we've got uh, cross-compilation support and supporting an increasing number of platforms. Um, but again, the way to think about that is like, for instance, uh, we wouldn't choose approachability over safety. Like, I don't think anybody can come to the Rust community and be like, we should not think about safety here so that it's easier to learn. Instead, uh, we'd make the choice for safety and then figure out the easiest way or the best ways to kind of uh, teach that concept. Um, and so that's a trade-off that we're willing to make. Um, and yeah, as I was saying, a lot of those values that we care about, the performance, uh, the correctness, all of that allows you to build uh, software with a lot of confidence. And by confidence, I just mean that you feel confident that that software is going to behave correctly. Uh, it's not going to just go down. It's not going to execute uh, parts that you didn't think of before and didn't handle correctly. Um, and so yeah, this idea that I want to kind of iterate, reiterate through is uh, rest and confidence. Um, so Rust affords us the ability to code with confidence and to code fearlessly, if you will, kind of like uh, taking off that idea of fearless concurrency that we have. Um, and that I think is extremely important uh, uh, when developing any piece of software. And this coming from the R Rust books forward, it says that yeah, Rust empowers you to reach farther to program with confidence. And then yeah, some. Um, people in art or some things I've just seen online. Uh, so Rust as a language is different, not because it's of its fancy syntax or welcoming community, but because of the confidence one gains uh, writing a program in it. I think that's from a Medium post I found somewhere. Uh, a friend of mine uh, replied to a tweet and said, I don't feel safe or confident in any language as long as I'm the one producing the code. <laughs> Potentially, you should write better code, I don't know. <laughs> um, no, I'm kidding. Uh, and yeah, he says, I think there's a certain level of complexity in Rust Lang we're all happy uh, to deal with in exchange to eliminating certain types of bugs. Again, that's kind of that thing of like, we're willing to uh, compromise uh, on some aspects, like approachability or making it uh, a simpler language for the other benefits that we get in terms of like correctness, performance, et cetera. Um, Another company, I think this is Ambit. I don't know how to pronounce that correctly. So yeah, they said, so far developing Rust has given us a slight confidence edge that we might not have otherwise had. Um, and then at the bottom there, that has given us incredible peace of mind and freed up mental bandwidth. And I think that's quite important. I think that's important as, um, as we develop software and build more infrastructure. Uh, it's, it's important that we feel confident in that software um, to do its job correctly and for us to not have to think about it too much and care about it too much. I don't, I did a lot of Python before and I didn't feel that much peace of mind writing it personally. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with it, but I wrote a lot of bad Python. <laughs> <laughs> it's, a, it's a me problem. Um, whereas Rust just doesn't allow me to write bad rust, I guess. Um, and so I have a lot of peace of mind, and I think, I mean, at Fly, we have a lot of peace of mind, and for anybody using rust in production, I'm sure that sentiment uh, is true for you too. So just some uh, aspects of rust and like situations that we've been in that kind of reiterates this idea of confidence. So uh, with, I mean, performance is obviously a big deal in rust, and we all care about having great performance. Um, but one thing that's been really great at Fly and in my own experience. Um, specifically, it's like we get to use uh, Rust feels pretty high level uh, as a language. We get a lot of nice syntax. We get um, uh, a very expressive language. It feels very modern. We get great dependency management. Um, and you can kind of write code uh, just using, let's say, standard Rust uh, idioms and then you, it comes out with this very uh, performant uh, artifact at the end. Um, and that's quite nice because we don't have to always reach uh, or have to know a lot of performance hacks or ways to kind of tweak our code. Of course, there will be situations, there have been, there will be in future, where we would have to kind of go that extra step and go a bit lower level, 
to uh, improve our performance. But for the most part, you can write Rust the way it's uh, in the most like idiomatic way, and you'll get something performant uh, at the end. Um, and that's really important. It means that people that are contributing, if they're not uh, extremely well versed with Rust, for instance, uh, they can contribute and just learn and and uh, uh, and contribute, and it will still we 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 pretty much have confidence that it will be performant enough for most cases. Um, without having to know anything uh, more extreme, I guess. Um, so that's, yeah, that's one part. Predictability, again, just reiterating that concept of uh, predictable performance. So obviously, Rust has no garbage collector. Um, and so you get these performance profiles that are pretty steady, uh, which is something I never knew. But then I saw this blog post, I think, by Discord and another one by Pusher. And uh, they kind of like pushed their systems to the edge. And uh, because of that, they had these huge latency spikes uh, during operation. So there's a graph here. This is by Discord. Um, and you can see this average response time. So the purple is Golang. And about every two minutes, uh, the, the garbage collector kicks in. And there's a huge spike in latency. Um, for us, again, we have a 100 millisecond budget. It's going to blow our budget. Um, Whereas with Rust, so they implemented a part of the, the they replaced that specific piece of Go code with Rust, and the blue line shows that performance. So you can see it's pretty predictable. You remove those latency sparks, and you can again have confidence uh, <coughs> in its performance. Um, and obviously, if you're writing code like uh, as it scales with Rust, you might realize that maybe you used inefficient data structures or the latency just goes crazy um, as you scale. But the nice thing in this case is that you're in control of that. So you can then implement or fix or find out better ways to improve your performance. Whereas the garbage collector, you can tune it as much as you want. But at the end of the day, it's not in your control. You can't get rid of it. It's still there. Uh, and so as you push your system, uh, you'll still get these uh, latency spikes. So. Yeah, developing with Rust, again, confidence that it'll behave as expected uh, in production. Correctness, obviously, there's multiple ideas with correctness. The one that we're carrying, or the one I'm talking about specifically, is just uh, handling error paths uh, and like none values, I guess. Um, and that's important for us because, like I said, I wrote a lot of bad Python. So I've written a lot of Python that, you know, on the happy path, I mean, it's happy, but on the bad path, blows up in production or in staging or whatever. Um, and when I found Rust, I was like, oh, I can't make those mistakes. Like the compiler just doesn't allow me to make those mistakes. Um, and I don't have to trust anybody else to not make those mistakes because the compiler will complain. Um, and so, yeah, that's really important because as we get more developers coming in, uh, as there's more uh, people touching our code base and improving it and getting better, we can still trust. Uh, that that other fact, again, that comes out at the end uh, will act reliably. It will handle all error paths uh, and just won't blow up in production um, or in staging or whatever. Um, so yeah, just some comments from, I think this is from One Signal. So they said, even better, one push needs very little attention. We're able to leave it running without any issues through the holiday break. Um, it's probably a unique scenario. I don't know if anybody's ever felt very chilled about leaving software unattended. <laughs> but um, yeah, in this case, you know, just using Rust for this particular system, uh, yeah, they felt that you know they were able to leave it running, didn't have many issues. Um, and again, that's because Rust forces you to handle certain situations and uh, again create these artifacts that are performant, they correct, etc. Uh, another one from them, if this loads, uh, I don't know what's going on. Ah, there we go. Uh, another thing, yeah, regressions are very infrequent. Uh, there's a huge class of bugs in languages like Ruby that just aren't possible in Rust. Um, and so when combined with good disk test coverage, it becomes difficult to break things, all thanks to Rust's fantastic type system. So yeah, again, just kind of like reiterating that point that you know, once you've created something with Rust, you can pretty much believe in it. Uh, maintainability, so um, 
from this aspect, I'm really talking about refactoring and the ability to refactor code. So there was a time uh, during Fly where we had, uh, where we refactored a lot of the proxy, um, just to kind of bring it up to more idiomatic Rust. Uh, and the nice thing is that you can really just lean on the compiler. So, you know, there's an expressive type system and you can model your domain pretty nicely. And then you can just go deleting fields and structs and whatever, and then just follow the compiler's errors as you work through it. Um, and then you can kind of uh, bring your application back to a good state. Uh, and again, once it compiles, you pretty much know that you can make logic errors for sure, but you pretty much know that uh, uh, all those fields or all the, the changes that you've made, um, you've covered the entire space of them that you need to. Uh, again, I've written a lot of bad Python. So I you know, changed the definition of an object, and then, woo, that field doesn't exist on your object anymore, and I'm like, ah, oh, yeah. Um, so yeah, for sure, like Rust, again, uh, enables you to refactor in quite an aggressive way. So one signal, again, they clearly love Rust. Uh, they say uh, the compiler and type system make refactoring basically foolproof. Uh, we like to say that Rust enables belligerent refactoring um, yeah, and then you're making dramatic changes and then working with the compiler to bring your project back to a working state. Um, again, just reiterating the same experience we've had at Fly, uh, yeah, where you can kind of be very dramatic um, and still, again, come out with a working artifact once it compiles. Uh, you're pretty happy with it. Um, and then I just saw this on Twitter, so compiler-driven development in Rust is so amazing. I cannot ever imagine going back to a language that doesn't have the ability to maybe make a root change to something and then guide me through all the different parts that are affected and need to be changed. So yeah, same, similar sentiments. Um, so yeah, just again, Rust affords us the ability to code with confidence, uh, to code fearlessly, if you will. Um, and so yeah, the values that it has and the things that it really cares about, uh, they've kind of created this higher order effect that Rust code that you deploy in production, you pretty much don't have to think about it because um, it does a good job. Thank you. <laughs> cool. Questions, I guess. Uh, just wait for Ethan there. Uh, thank you for this talk. This was very interesting. Thank you. And <coughs> you mentioned uh, in one of the problems with Rust is that it's difficult to get experience to yes. hire experienced Rust programmers. Yeah. Have you had any experience in uh, hiring C++ programmers and training them <laughs> to, <laughs> to, to do Rust? <laughs> that's, a, that's a good question. Um, no, we haven't. I don't, I'm not involved in hiring, so I don't know if that's a case of like we're unwilling or they just haven't come to fly, I'm not sure. Um, but yeah. From Fly's experience, uh, we haven't had that uh, trying to train C++ engineers to learn Rust. Yeah, hey yeah it's cool to see uh, Fly embracing Rust. Um, yeah. But you mentioned about doing a lot of edge compute. Like, are you interested in the idea of doing like a lot of uh, WebAssembly edge computation rather than having to spin up a whole VM? Um, I'm not sure, to be honest. I don't. I don't know. <laughs> Uh, but I assume we would be excited to do that, but it's not something on my radar uh, at this point in time. Hello, um, thanks for the talk. Cool. Do your edge compute units have state on them? And if, if not, what kind of workloads do they best suit? If you had like a messaging app, uh, sure. I take it it couldn't, couldn't speed up if it had to go across the central state anyway. So do you have like local caches and things like that? Uh, so are you saying that from our edge network, so are you asking if at the edge network we run instance like your app yeah, on the edge? It, on, on the edge, do you have like subsets of the databases so you can respond to stateful requests or is the uh, uh, edge just for stateless requests? So I'm not sure entirely that I understand the question, but just to explain how that system works. So um, yeah, at the requests come in at the edge, and then the edge at least knows where all your instances are and where everything's running and will proxy it there. So I guess you could say it's stateless, um, but there are cases where, so we can handle like retries for you, so uh, we know that, but I'm not sure if that answers your question 
at all. Okay, thank you. Are you sure? Yes. Oh, okay, cool. Hi, uh, um, you cool. mentioned this in your session description. So what are your experiences using Worcester to manage eBPF? Oh, yeah, so we, yeah, so we um, have some components of the BPF that we use uh, in Rust. It's been pretty good. It's been pretty good. There's a library called Aya, Aya BPF, uh, or a library, sorry. Um, and we've used that uh, pretty extensively, and it's worked well for us. Um, yeah, it's also nice because then we didn't have to write it in C. Uh, <laughs> which means I could contribute. I don't know C, so. <laughs> um, yeah, so it's been good. It's been good. All right, thanks for the talk. Um, cool. when, I, when you were talking quite confidently about uh, whole classes of errors, just not kind of problems in general, not mm -hmm. coming up in Rust, mm -hmm. it occurred to me that, I mean, has this affected the, the kind of cost benefit calculus of writing tests? Has it changed where you put the effort into in writing tests sure. in any way? Um, so, for sure, in the sense that there are some cases where we don't need to have as extensive test coverage. So something like, again, like the refactoring, there are parts of that where we don't have to uh, have a very extensive test sheet to capture that. Like also because it's a proxy, like the main thing is uh, integration testing, because we need to know uh, that any changes we've made that don't affect our platform negatively. Um, but we still write tests. I mean, we still have quite a number of them in our system. And again, you can still make a lot of logic errors, so we still have tests to cover those specific cases. Um, but it was definitely less than, for instance, that I had to write in Python. Yeah. Thanks a lot for the talk. Um, cool. Just out of curiosity, what kinds of features are in the fly proxy that were, would not be in like a off-the-shelf proxy sure. like nginx or, or something like that just kind of curious about sure. the decision to write that piece from scratch. Right. um so a good one is we have this uh feature called fly replay uh, and how fly replay works is uh basically um let's say you want to decide which instance a request goes to uh you can we have like a, a certain header that you can set um and then it'll get captured at the edge uh but for instance let's say you want to root you you want to have an app that does the routing for you essentially what will happen is that uh, the request will come into that app that app will then respond with the fly replay header to say root this to this instance or to this other region or something like that um and then we'll do that uh, for you so the reason it got created was for um uh databases we're running databases so basically you'd have obviously your leader and then a whole bunch of read replicas and it's very difficult to control which uh, uh, um, database your request would land on. So essentially what would happen is that uh, the database would error and say, I'm not the leader, and then we'd just replay it to the leader database, essentially. So that's just something that we've like been able to easily implement uh, in our system because we control the proxy, essentially. Hey, thanks for the talk. Sure. Um, I just wanted to ask, um, as you said you were coming from a Python background, what was your yeah. experience like learning Rust um, yeah. as someone who was like had no systems programming background? Yeah, sure. So for me, I learned it quite early in my career. Well, I mean, I'm still early career, but I learned it quite early. So I don't really have too many biases or any kind of like ingrained ways of coding. So I just read it and I was like, if this moves there, then it moves, kind of thing. So <laughs> 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 um, it was difficult uh, in the sense that uh, there were a lot of new concepts and I didn't really know how to grapple my head around them. But I, I had the idea that with Rust, I'm just going to take my time. So I, I read the book entirely before even writing any code, which is not like me, but it worked for me in the end. Um, but yeah, I didn't have to like work through a lot of uh, Content that I had to like unwind to make Rust make sense. I just had to kind of like uh, 
just grok it the way it is. Um, so yeah, it, but it's been difficult in some ways, but also not as bad as people make it sound, if I can put it that way. Yeah. Any more questions? Um, thanks for the talk. Out of curiosity, sure. do you support HTTP3 in fly proxy or rely on the hyper, hyper capabilities? Uh, so, yeah, we, rel we rely on Hopper most of the time. I don't think we support HTTP3 at the moment, though. It's in the works, but uh, not right now, yeah. <coughs> yeah, thank you. Cool. Okay, please give a final hand for Senya.